peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. When Melanie came a little while ago, I asked her next time she comes to bring a song with her. Well, she didn't last time, so I told her next time she comes to bring a song with her. So she brought a song with her, so Melanie, come sing it for us. solo with Pierre probably 10, 12 years ago maybe. Uh -huh. uh, no, I'll take that back. I think we y'all had a fifth Sunday uh, service and uh, I sang a little. So y'all y'all bear with me because I'm a little nervous and I'm going to tell on Joan. So if I start looking at Joan and making faces, she said if I got nervous, just make just have to look at her and make faces. So that means you need to come more often and sing. There you go. <laughs> y'all bear with me. To the simple like faith, as a child I once knew, like the prodigal son, I long for my loved ones, for the comforts of home, and the God I outgrew. <coughs> I have returned. Bethlehem's babe, prophet's Messiah, he's Jesus to me, eternal deity, praise his name, I have returned. Return to the God of my mother with unfailing faith for the child of her heart. She said, Bring him up in the way that you want him. Thank God when he's grown. He'll never depart. I have returned to the God of my mother. I learned on her knees. He's the lily of the valley. He's Jesus to me. Eternal deity. Praise his name, I have returned. I have returned to the God of my father, the most God-like man a child could know. Just heard a shout from the angels in glory. Praise the Lord, a child has come home. I have returned to the God of my 
my father, creator of heaven and earth, God of the universe. He's Jesus to me, eternal deity. Praise his name. I have returned. I have returned to the Yahweh of Judah. On my knees I did fall, where the wall now stands. This lesson I've learned as I work my way homeward. The savior of all is a comfort to man. I have returned to the father of Abraham, shepherd of Moses, who called him the great I am. He's Jesus to me, eternal deity. Praise his name. I have returned. I have returned. I don't know what you were nervous about. So I'm glad you returned, and, I, and you can return anytime you want to <laughs> come sing for us. Beautiful song. I, I can't say I've ever heard that one. But it is a mighty God that we serve that she was singing about, number 672. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. He is a mighty God, and it's faith in that mighty God that we can face anything that the world throws at us, and it's that faith in God that is our victory. Number two, 727. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall bow the glowing skies against the foe in vows below. Let all your strengths be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith laid like a whirlwind's breath, swept over all the field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array. 
Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread and echo with our shout. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, what raiment shall be given? Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in him. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame. We'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. This morning in our time when we normally have special music, and uh, I want to take this time once again. Flo's going to play a little, and... And I just feel we need to pray. We need to take time to pray. We haven't been meeting on Wednesday nights. I, I miss that time that we have together in prayer. But there's a lot we need to be praying about. We need to pray for the people we know who are lost souls that, that need to come to the Lord. We need to pe pray for the people who have strayed from the Lord and need to come back to Him. We need to pray for our Supreme Court and the decisions being made here on Roe versus Wade coming up soon. We need to pray for the states that are trying to pass laws to, to actually commit infanticide and kill babies up to 28 days after birth. There, there's so much that's happening in our world right now. And Christians need to be on their knees and pray. God, God says, I, I've got it. I know what I'm doing. I'm taking care of it. But he says, still, he wants us to petition him. Not so we can ask him to do things, because he already knows what he's going to do. But how are we going to know how he's working if we haven't approached him to ask him to take care of things? There's things happening in the world that God's doing, and we don't even see it. Because we haven't asked the Lord to get involved in it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with open hearts, humbled hearts, breaking hearts. Lord, this things happening in this world weigh heavy on my heart. Lord, I know it's all signs of you returning and it's things we're supposed to know are going to happen. But, but Lord, you also ask us to pray. Lord, I serve a God that's alive and over His creation. And you ask us to approach your throne of grace humbly as believers. Lord, there's so many people who I hear, well, I'm going to pray, Lord, for you. And they don't live their life as if they've even surrendered to you. So the Lord doesn't even hear what they say. Lord, I pray that my life is cleansed enough worthy enough that I've repented of every sin that's in my life that you've showed me and that I'm surrendering fully to your will. And Lord, I ask you to hear my humble cries this morning and those of the hearts of the ones that are here. Lord, there's a chance that you would convict the hearts of those in our Supreme Court to overturn the greatest injustice against you that has ever been done. So many babies taken from this world 
And Satan's laughing because he knew one of them was a great evangelist or somebody that could reach that one person. But Lord, we're here and you've given us that same call to reach the lost, to tell them about Jesus Christ. Lord, give me that strength, that boldness, Wipe all the fear from my heart, from my mind. And Lord, let me not worry about it. For I know in the end I'm serving you greatly. And Lord, may I take that stand against the things of this world. Lord, I'm getting tired of hearing Satan laugh. Because churches are emptying. Worship's not happening. But Lord, I, I, I don't know if it's the time you're coming back or not. But Lord, I pray that we fill churches with people who believe, are willing to worship and willing to serve. Not willing to have a fellowship or willing to have a good time or or. Ones that want to surrender their lives to you. And Lord, I thank you for those that are steadfast in this church. That I know are on their knees every day praying and surrendering to your will. Continue to give them the strength in their bodies. The healing that they need. And may they feel the joy that only you can give in light of all the things that are happening. I thank you for the blessings upon this congregation that you give us this building to worship in, that you allow things to be taken care of and the funds. And Lord, you just bless us over and over again that we're able to serve halfway around the world through a, a young man, that we're able to witness to those through a meal. But Lord, my heart breaks because there's so many people that I know that have stood up in a church and proclaimed their love for you and their love is wax cold. Lord, I pray that your spirit convicts their heart so that they're so unrestless they can't sleep until they realize that it's grieving the spirit soul if that spirit's in their life. Or, Lord, that they realize that maybe they never truly surrendered their life to you. Lord, through your messages, you're telling us. But, Lord, give us that boldness that we don't let it stay here in this church. That we take it out to this world. And we thank you for your message here this morning. It's in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. So this morning, Psalms 26. We'll continue back in our study of Psalms. So based on that, we've been on this for 26 weeks now. So Psalms 26. Four high school boys were late for their morning class one day. They entered the classroom and solemnly told their teacher that they were detained due to a flat tire. The sympathetic teacher smiled and told them that it was too bad because they were late because they missed a test this morning. But she was willing to give them a makeup test, and she gave each of them a piece of paper and a pencil, and she sent each of them to the four corners of the classroom, and she said, you can pass this test with 100% if you but answer one question. And as they got to the four corners of the classroom, she asked them which tire was flat. Now, how many of you here like tests? I didn't like tests when I was in school. I don't even like the tests they put on TV for the emergency broadcast system because it usually messes with something I'm watching. Uh, I didn't like pop quizzes. I hated pop quizzes. And I thought as I got older, 
that I was done with tests. They're all over and everything. But then as I got older, I started having to go to the doctor. And I go to the doctor, and he says, well, I have to send you for some tests. I hate that word. <laughs> Do you know what an acid test is? An acid test, we don't hear much about it now, but when gold was being circulated widely, they would take nitric acid and they would apply it to what people would bring in and say they found gold to find out if it was genuine or not. If it was fake, the acid would just decompose the rock or whatever it is they brought in, but if it was genuine, the gold was ineffective. So this morning, we're going to see if we can survive God's acid test this morning. Psalms 26, verse 1, a psalm of David. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons. Neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. I will wash mine hands with innocency. So will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with thy voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and in the right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. For my foot standeth not, my foot standeth in an even place, in the congregations will I bless the Lord. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, be with us this morning as we look at this test that David brought himself to. Can you pass God's test this morning? Luke 21, 26 tells us that men's hearts will fail them because of fear in the last days. Many people are afraid and live in fear. We're afraid of violent and crime. We're afraid of terrorism. We're afraid of nuclear war. You saw in the news the other day, Russia said, I've tested an, a long-range missile with nuclear capabilities. We're, we're afraid of global pollution. We're afraid of illnesses. We're afraid of death. We're afraid of economic collapse. We could go on and on of the things that people are afraid of these days. As we'll see next week in Psalms 27, the Lord is our salvation. It says, whom shall we fear? But in our scripture today, David was in exile. He was being pursued by King Saul. Even though David knew that he was the next king of Israel, he would not lift his hand against Saul. Saul had already been rejected by God. His reign was coming to an end. But in David's eyes, as long as God allowed Saul to reign, he was still God's chosen man. And David would not fight against God's anointed. Makes you wonder today, doesn't it? God's chosen man. Therefore, David was a man of integrity, it says. Integrity meant that David could be as steady as a rock in his obedience to God no matter whether the circumstances were in his favor or not. And even though David was a man who walked after God, Paul referred to him this way in Acts 13, 22. It says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Even though David was a God, man after God's own heart, David was not perfect. He had many great sins and failures in his life. But even in all of his sin, David went before his holy God. He confessed 
He repented of that sin, and that's what made him a man of integrity. Integrity doesn't mean that we'll never make a mistake or never stray from the mission to serve the Lord. It does mean, though, that our ultimate goal and our final destination will always lead us back to the same place. And that place is where we will follow the Lord. So David, now in exile and running from Saul, writes this psalm to God, asking God to put his heart to the test. How many of us today are really willing to let God test our loyalty, our love, our commitment, and our integrity to Him? I don't know about you, but it's a fearful thing to know that God will test us and examine the motives and integrities of our heart. I can only pray and trust that I'm doing right to pass the test. And I can only hope and pray that everyone here will pass that test also. But, you know, in the world today, teachers grade on a curve. You know what that is? They take the, the, the best score in the class, whichever it was, and, and then they take the next lowest score, and they take the difference, and they give it to everybody below that so that their scores will be up. They grade on a curve. God doesn't grade on a curve. His tests are absolute. There's only one answer in His test that will be the right answer. Too many youth today are graduating high schools without even the basic knowledge and skills to even get a mediocre job. They can't even go to a, a McDonald's and count money. When they grade on a curve, the standards of excellence and integrity will be lowered. With God, the answers to the test He gives is either right or wrong. There's only one right answer. So David says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins in my heart. David was willing to stand up to God's test. Are we? Is your heart right with God? Are your motives for serving Jesus righteous and holy? Do we serve God because we love Him? Or do we serve God out of a sense of duty? Do we really love Jesus? How many people are going to church in the morning because they want to meet people? They want to fellowship. They want to show how godly they are. Are you coming to church because you want to praise Him, worship Him, serve Him, and serve His people? It's a wonderful thing to be faithful to God and to work faithfully in a ministry that God's given us. But we must never forget that doing so is just filling a reasonable service to God. Unless we come and do the things we do simply because we love the Lord and we want to work for Him, then our motive isn't right. And our work will bring no reward in the end. My cry is this, Lord, I want to be faithful because I love you. Lord, I want to serve you and your people because I know that is what you want me to do. Lord, I want to I don't want any glory. I don't want any recognition or praise for it all belongs to you. Lord, I just want to be what and where you want me to be with a clean heart. Lord, don't let me slide into self-gratification. Lord, keep my motives pure before me, my heart right in your sight. Can you pass God's test this morning? If you can honestly say like David... I've never coveted what somebody else had. I've never sought to live the ways that this world lives. I never allowed myself to give in. Then just maybe you can pass that test. Anybody ready to take it yet? David asked God to test his motives and test his hearts. He says, try my reins in my heart. Now, David was a brave soul who did not shy away from God's testing. He actually stepped up and asked God to test him. 
Are you willing to let God try your reins this morning? Do you know what reins are? If you've ever ridden a horse, you know what reins are. If you've ever driven a horse-drawn carriage, if you've ever watched an old Western movie, you know that reins are the steering wheel for the horse. That's simple. It's what is used to allow the animal to go the direction you want it to go and to move along. Are you willing to let God do that? Are you willing to let God steer you? Are you willing to let God test your power steering? You know, have you, how many of you have driven a car that didn't have power steering? M mostly everybody in here has probably driven a car that didn't have power steering. Once you got power steering, you want another car like that again? No. How about God testing you your power steering? Sometimes our power steering, God's grabbing hold of the wheel, and he goes, and he goes, because we ain't moving. <laughs> He will try and allow you to face great obstacles in your life. And sometimes you're going to have huge potholes in the road. You know, and sometimes as we're traveling along, he makes a few road signs disappear in our life. And that's when you really have to let him just take hold of your heart and your life. And if you don't, you're going to wind up in places that you don't want to be. Remember Psalms 23 we looked at a little while ago? David said, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still water. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the patch of righteousness for my name's sake. God will never steer you down the wrong path. That's why David said, Try my reins. Take a hold of me, Lord. You may not always see it with your eyes or, or feel that you're going in the right direction, but God will never leave you and lead you down the wrong path. He will always lead you to righteousness and peace. If we just learn to allow Him to do the driving and to learn to completely trust Him, just then maybe we can pass this test. But we fail the test when our trust disappears. And we try to grab the reins out of His hand in our life. And then what happens? We start to stray from God. David said, For thy loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with disassemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. David was confident that his heart and his motives were right. And he was not afraid to tell God, examine me. Look at my heart. Look at my motives. David knew he could pass the test. Because he kept his love of God and his love for his fellow man first and foremost in his heart. He knew he could pass the test because he had walked in the path of righteousness that God had placed before him. Even though the path was dark and dangerous. And even deadly as Saul pursued him. David knew he could pass the test because he kept away from all those who would lift his heart in pride through their vain praises of his leadership ability. David knew he could pass the test because he had not listened to the voices of those men, those in his own rank who would encourage him to attack and destroy Saul. And take what God had already said was his anyway. David knew he could pass the test because he would not listen to those voices that would bring about war and strife and disunity in the nation of Israel. David knew he could pass the test because he hated sin in any form. Whether it was in his own life, his in army's life, in the camp of his enemies. He didn't matter where it was. David knew he could pass the test because he would not listen to the advice of the hearts who are not right with God, no matter how logical or reasonable that counsel seemed. So how do we prepare ourselves for God's test? First thing you must do is keep yourself unspotted from sin in the world around us. David said, I won't even go into it. Walk in holiness and sanctification before the Lord. Don't allow pride to rise up within your heart and convince us that we have the right 
Isn't that what this world's doing? We have the right. No, you don't. You have the right to do whatever God has in plan for your life. Don't allow Satan to convince us that we need to hear the voice of reason. We need to hear the voice of God. You know what Satan loves the most to sow? Discord. Whether through direct spiritual intervention within our heart and our mind or through our friends, our family, and associates. He loves it. He, he loves to sow discord to make us think that we're right and everyone else is wrong. He loves to sow discord to make us think that we've got it all figured out. And he loves to sow discord because he makes us start pulling our own reins and doing what we think's best instead of what the Lord and the Holy Spirit wants us to do. So David says in verse 6, I will wash my hands in innocency so that I can compass thy altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. You know, uh, I think they had COVID back then because washing hands was frequent for the Jews. It was something they did. And it wasn't just to cleanse themselves. Sometimes it was to say that they declared innocence of wicked deeds. Look at Pilate. Pilate did so when he protested innocence in the maltreatment of Christ. He said, I washed my hands of this matter. The priest, when they served in the tabernacle in the wilderness, were required to wash their hands, signifying the washing of sin from their hands before they could even enter the Holy of Holies. David knew his hands were innocent and that he was cleansed from sins of rebellion and hatred against Saul. He wanted God's test to show that he was right. And where did David stay? He, he stayed around God's altar. He placed his confidence and trust and respect in that awesome God of Israel who is able to deliver and perform that which he always promises. David stayed right with God. He stayed on his face before God in prayer and in confession and allowed God to steer his thoughts and his heart. David's testimony was intact. His salvation and innocence was were not compromised. He remained faithful and true. Therefore, he was not afraid of God testing his heart. Well, we know later on David fell. But he repented. He knew he fell. He knew his heart was separated from God. He could testify God's mercy and love because he personally experienced it. It wasn't just head knowledge he had. He knew it because he had that personal relationship and in his heart, he knew. How can we witness to somebody something we haven't seen, felt, heard, or know firsthand? If we witness something that we don't know firsthand, what is it? Gossip. Well, I heard there was a wreck down here and this happened. Do you know that happened? Well, no, that's what I heard. But if you were there and saw it, you know firsthand. So how can we tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ unless we know Him intimately? How can we lead others to the testing of God on their hearts if we haven't passed the test ourselves? The Lord is testing our world right now. He is testing to see who is worthy to be with Him and who's just giving lip service. When you have passed God's test and you know that your heart and your motives are right, it's not hard to tell others the right answers so that they can pass the test also. But if we can't pass the test ourselves, how are we going to help others do it? David said, Lord, I have loved the habitation of the house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. So here a question arises. Why do we come to church? I hope you come here because you know that the Lord will meet us here in all of His glory, 
and that you desire to be in his presence and you desire to be in the presence of other people who know him just like you do. I hope you come here to learn more about Jesus Christ, more about his ways, more about how you can become more like him every day. And if you come to church for the right reason, then you'll have the same attitude that David had when he wrote Psalms 122 that we'll see. He said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. How many people are glad because you go to them and say, hey, let's go to church on Sunday morning. I know I have to. If we don't have the right attitude and we fail God's test, then our desire won't be for the Lord. And what will happen? We won't attend church at all. What's happening in this world? People have found out with COVID that they never had a desire to be with the Lord because churches are empty. Fox 16 put an article out last week on Sunday. It said Americans are going to church less and less with church membership dropping below 50% for the first time in eight decades, according to the goals polls from Gallup. Only 47% of Americans say they belong to church synagogue or mosque in 2020 the number was 70 percent in 1999 in fact it says church membership in the u.s hovered 70 percent since all the way back to the 1930s since the turn of the century the figure has steadily declined the portion of Americans who say they do not identify with any religion whatsoever has now grown from 8% in 1999 to over 20% in the past two years. Then there are people in between, those who identify with religion but don't attend church. And if you guessed it, you can tell the newer generation... The less they attend church or identify with religion at all. It says nearly 60% of baby boomers attend church, but only 36% of millennials. Considering the generation gap, the decline in religious affiliation makes sense. Each year, younger generations make up the larger part of the U.S. adult population. But numbers are down even still for those in older generations, meaning the trend is across the board. It says, however, Gallup found declines in church membership are proportionally smaller among political conservatives, married adults, and college graduates. 2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. It's happening. I hope that everyone will pass the test and remain faithful to the Lord this morning. But again, David says that I won't hang around with the world's crowd. He doesn't want anything to do with those guilty of having blood of lost souls on their hands in the judgment. David knew, as we should know, that if we hang around with worldly people, we'll become like them. Not only will they bring themselves to destruction, but they will drag us down with them as well. If we are saved and we hang around long enough... We will not feel the Holy Spirit convicting us any longer and will we be deceived into believing that all is well when it isn't. Would you want to stand before a holy Lord and try to explain this to Him? I guess the bigger question would be then, did you really have a personal relationship with Him in the first place? I found this little thing. Did you know that pigs don't know that pigs stink? <laughs> when a pig is down in a pig pen long enough, the only thing a pig wants to do is find more mud and more filthiness to wallow in. He isn't happy unless he's deep in mud and deep in stench. 
And I can guarantee you the swine barn during the fair is one of the worst places to be. And if one pig decides to get out of the mud, the other pigs will shove them back in it. You know, my mother would always say, misery loves company. And that makes a valid point. People often won't allow us to leave their circle easily. They don't like it when someone tries to leave them and make a better life because they've surrendered to the Lord. Because what happens? They don't want them to leave because what happens? It makes them look bad. They may claim they love you. They may claim, well, we'll miss you. But in reality, they're feeling guilty. And they refuse to change. Don't let these lies keep you from rising out of the muck and mire. Jesus will help us. All we have to do is give Him the reins. He'll lift us out of that miry clay and place us on a rock where we can experience God's best for us. And once we leave that pig pen of sin, you'll be able to look back and clearly see how bad your life was. And only then will your past life begin to stink to you. Only then will you see the reality of the filth that was in your life. How many times I look back and, and I live like that? God has opened your eyes and cleaned you up before you realize just how bad you really smelled. So to wrap this all up, David said in verse 11, But as for me, I will walk in my integrity, redeem me, and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. Are you ready to face God and pass His test this morning? Are you ready to say, Lord, bring it on. I've studied. I've got everything down. Come on, test me. Take hold of my reins. I'll walk uprightly. I'll serve you. Are you ready to say, Lord, I will maintain my integrity. I will love you. I will serve you with all my heart. You've redeemed me. You brought me with your precious blood. I'm founded upon the solid rock. I'm standing on solid level ground through the power of the Holy Spirit. I won't fail your examination. I will obey your commands. I will stand and praise the Lord for all He's done for me. Because I'm saved, I can pass the test. Because I'm Holy Ghost filled, I can pass the test. Because I'm fire baptized, I can pass the test. Because I've been washed in the blood of redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ. You've pulled me out of the miry clay. I've survived the storms. I've walked through the valley of fire. I've crossed over the bridge that's over troubled water. And Lord, I'm ready to take that test this morning. Prove me today, Lord. That's what David was saying. Prove me today, Lord. More people need to be on their knees saying, Lord, test me. Try me. Prove me. Show me that my life is what you want it to be. And one good thing about God is when you take his test, if you don't know the answer, he'll give it to you. It's an open book test right here. I used to love those tests. All you have to do is know where to look it up. Try me today, Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, Sunday school, sermon, Lord, you just... Why such a small congregation to hear this, Lord? Maybe the test has to start with us. Maybe there's somebody else we need to reveal this to. To truly understand what it means to surrender to the Lord. Lord, may have I fully surrendered to you this morning. I can't praise you enough. 
And it's in your name I pray. Amen. 483, the Savior is waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time he has waited before, and now he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. Are we willing to open that door up for Christ to come in? Pete, would you close our service in a word of prayer and pray for our business meeting at this time?